This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. There seems to be no heavier a pain to carry than that of the loss of a child. It's hard enough to lose a child to a health issue or accident, but when a stranger and violence is involved, it seems unimaginable how a parent or a family member could get through the day when their heart has been shattered by the loss, or worse, when they don't know where their child is or what happened to them. Today I'll be telling two stories of young children who went missing under bizarre circumstances, These cases are considered open, but they are, in essence, solved. And both cases will have you asking, were family members involved? These are the stories of Wallace Guidros and Lenoria Jones and their mysterious disappearances. Born in Louisiana in 1957, Stanley Guidros would grow up to find himself a member of the Army a choice that would end up dictating pivotal points in his life. From 1978 to 79, he was stationed in South Korea, where he would meet his future wife, Chom M. Gidros, who was 20 years old. After getting married while still in South Korea, the couple was transferred to Fort Lewis McCord in Washington. On March 24, 1980, they welcomed their baby boy, Wallace. Wallace's first few months were not easy. Born two months premature, he had to stay in the hospital and spent his first 30 days of life on a respirator. Home for a week, his breathing issues continued, and he had to go back to the hospital for pneumonia treatment. Work wasn't always the easiest for the couple. Stanley's employment history has been called sketchy, but what exactly that means isn't clear. He did, however, leave the army on his own accord when he was to be stationed in Germany, but was told that his wife and young child would not be able to join him. The Germany transfer came just a week after Wallace was home. With Chom speaking barely more than broken English, she was resigned to working at a local sauna in Fife, Washington. And Stanley worried that her newness to the country would make it difficult for her to manage Wallace's many doctor appointments and medications, so he came home. That hadn't been an easy choice for Stanley to make. Even though he served his country for seven years, the decision to stay home with his family cost him his job and security. Another cost? All of Wallace's medical bills would no longer be covered. For most people, that would add stress and distance to a relationship. For Stanley, he said it made he and his wife closer. Monday, January 10, 1983, seemed like a normal day. Stanley and Wallace drove the 10 miles northwest from Fife to Point Defiance Park in Tacoma, the same location as Emily's episode, Point Defiance. Stanley and his adorable two-and-a-half-year-old son spent the day fishing and enjoying each other's company. Finishing up for the day, they took a walk around the park, coming across another family with a young child. Sweet little Wallace was friendly and outgoing, so he and the little girl started playing. Happy to have a break from childcare for a moment, Stanley and the man, who he presumed to be the girl's father, started chatting. Happy to take a father break, the guys decided to take a walk to a nearby waterfall, leaving the girl, the presumed mother, and Wallace to play. After wrapping up their chat, the man, who was described as a white guy, late 20s to early 30s, six foot tall, medium build with shoulder length, sandy brown hair, a mustache, beard, and decayed or broken front teeth, and he was wearing a baseball hat, then went back to the location of his wife and child, leaving Stanley behind. Being the 80s, he was totally cool with two strangers watching his kid for him, so he hung out at the waterfall in childless bliss for about 10 minutes. Walking back to the area of the park the children had been playing, Stanley couldn't find them. It was a little after 5 p.m., Searching desperately for his child, possibly embarrassed by his parenting choices, he didn't make the call for help until 7.42 p.m. After placing the call from the Goldfish Tavern, which Stanley had walked to to use their phone, he went back to the park where he met up with multiple police officers from multiple agencies. 
This was pre-Amber Alert, but once the word was out that a young boy was missing, friends, neighbors, and strangers joined the effort. There were helicopters above and divers below the waters of the park. When it was clear Wallace wasn't just hiding in the bushes, the search then included a Tacoma fireboat crew, Evergreen Search and Rescue, and search dogs. People who didn't know Wallace but wanted to assist even took their personal planes to the sky in hopes of spotting something. Wanting to make sure they had every piece of information, police interviewed Stanley again later that night. It was in that interview he admitted that he had some beers left over from fishing, so he and the dad each had one as they hung out by the waterfall. And no, he hadn't stayed behind for 10 minutes. He did walk back to the kids with the father. Once they got back to the spot the kids should have been, Stanley started looking around before realizing the father just walked off in an opposite direction. Those details weren't different enough to be concerning, but it was odd to the detectives that Stanley was willing to offer the information, but only by responding to direct questions. In addition to the description of the man, he provided information about the woman. She was also white, had light blonde hair past her shoulders, notably long eyelashes, was about 5 foot 2 and about 115 pounds. She was in her mid-twenties, and her daughter, who is about the same age as Wallace, between 2 and 3, had similar hair as the mother. Something about Wallace's case was nagging investigators. They couldn't put their finger on it. It was just one of those professional hunches telling them that they were missing a piece of information. But they had a father who had been cooperative and promised to be providing all the information he could in hopes of finding his son. Stanley hadn't only searched the area, but he had even stopped a bus driver to ask if they had seen his son or the family that took him. That sounded nice and all, but when detectives spoke with all of the drivers, eight in total, who could have been running routes in the area during that time, none recalled having seen or spoken to Stanley. Telling authorities that fatherhood was difficult, Stanley claimed his wife would be gone from the house for days, sometimes weeks at a time. I'm not sure if he was alluding to drug use or sex work or if she just wanted to be out of the house, but it left him, in essence, a single father. It didn't help that he was an unemployed stay-at-home dad. I don't say that to mean being a stay-at-home dad isn't a job, but that wasn't how he saw it. It was that he was forced to be a stay-at-home dad because of his unemployment status. In hopes of changing that, he was taking a heavy equipment operator course. Using the information Stanley provided, searches continued, not just for Wallace, but for the family of suspects. A local printer provided Stanley with posters, which he hung on his own. The police flyer was taking too long for his liking, and he wanted the information out. Police were waiting to post anything until they had more details to make their poster, but theirs would eventually include composite sketches of the man and woman, and it would also include rewards, $1,000 from Crime Stoppers, $1,000 from the local CBS station KIRO in Seattle, and more funds were raised by a local woman who held a drive at a bank. After the composite sketches were posted, of course tips came in, one being a possibly strong lead. A woman reported she had been at the park the same day Wallace was taken, and she had seen the man, woman, and child. Not only had she seen them, but she claimed the couple had attempted to abduct her children twice. This information is provided by the Charlie Project, and it claims that the outcome of this tip was that the woman's story was never verified. So I don't know if that means that they couldn't find her to talk to her, or when they spoke to her, her story didn't seem accurate, but it didn't help the investigation or Wallace. Search parties combed the area of and around the park, but with no sign of Wallace. Everyone had their eyes out for the three-foot-tall, 35-pound boy with adorably curly brown hair who was only two months away from his third birthday. In the first few weeks of the investigation, there was an arrest. After taking a K-9 unit out to the park, officers found a 33-year-old man that fit the description of the man in question, and he was living in the park. He was questioned, but it was quickly realized he was not the kidnapper. He was too tall, too well-groomed, and his teeth were intact the most distinguishing feature provided by Stanley. In the end, the man was only charged with trespassing because he was living in the woods. Wallace's parents dreaded March 24th, what would have been his third birthday. They knew he would have wanted to have gone to Chuck E. Cheese and gone wild on some french fries. Emotionally speaking to reporters about the loss of her child, Chom said, 
I think I lost my baby and I lost my husband too because he is so scared. He shakes. He does not sleep. He does not eat. We look at pictures of my baby and he cries. I am scared he will drive out of his mind. I am so scared now of everybody. Everything scares me since I lost my baby. My friends, they are so worried. They call me. They are so nice. They pray for me. They say, anything you need, any way we can help you, but the only help is to find my baby. Wallace's case had plenty of attention at first. The rewards helped. Tips were coming in, but they were leading nowhere. Stanley was left begging the kidnappers via newspapers to just let him know what to do to get his son back. He didn't know or care if they wanted money for a ransom. He just wanted to know how to get his son home safely. The Gleed Roses would never get those answers. Time passed, and Wallace's story fell from the front page, then from the papers altogether. There was never a word from kidnappers. Stanley and Chom may have had a strengthened relationship after the loss of his health benefits and the initial loss of Wallace, but the continued search was too much. Within two years of his disappearance, the couple divorced. Stanley went back to his home state of Louisiana. Chom settled in East Chicago, Indiana. There are stories that mention she ended up in Chicago, but she actually lived in East Chicago, which is so far west in Indiana, it is basically part of Chicago. So I just wanted to clear that up in case anyone was doing their own research. Sadly, due to unknown circumstances, Chom passed away in her home on July 29, 1995, at just 37 years old. The years went on. Stanley remarried in 2003. His second wife was Papitra Ann Bentley from Raceland, Louisiana, who ended up in Homo with Stanley. Stanley sort of stayed on the radar of Washington investigators, but there was nothing new for them to work with, no new questions to ask him. But in 2011, Wallace's case would be broken open, but at a heartbreaking cost. Stanley and Petitra's marriage was tumultuous, and for seven years they tried to make it work. Their relationship came to an end in the early morning hours of March 9, 2011. It had been a relationship that her family claimed was riddled with abuse and arguments. Heading out to get breakfast a little after 5 a.m., the couple wound up sitting in Stanley's parked 1999 Ford Mustang behind a Burger King on Tunnel Boulevard because they had been discussing their marriage and the conversation had turned into a heated argument. Grabbing an unknown weapon, Stanley then stabbed Pepitra multiple times, Either in shock or just clueless about what to do regarding the choices he made, Stanley put his wife's bleeding, lifeless body into the back seat, and then he drove. It was a bit after noon when 54-year-old Stanley pulled up to a police station in Zachary, Illinois, more than 100 miles away from where the murder took place. Walking inside, he turned himself in and informed the officers that his wife's body, which he'd been driving around for over seven hours now, was in the back seat. He was immediately charged with the second-degree murder of 47-year-old Pepitra Ann Bentley. She had changed her maiden name to his, but I don't think that connection needs to be made in this case. He was then held on a million-dollar bond. As we know, even today, there isn't a lot of cross-communication within agencies, so 11 years ago, it's not like it was any better. So when Stanley was arrested for murder, the cold case team working Wallace's case wasn't informed. But that doesn't mean that they didn't find out about it. At the same time Stanley was being booked for murder, Detective Jean Miller of Tacoma's cold case unit had reviewed Wallace's case. Going through those initial interviews with Stanley, Jean noticed that there were discrepancies and differences in the details that he had shared. Even more alarming, he came across a CPS report from 1982, which had been filed just months before Wallace's disappearance. The physical referral hadn't made it into the file, but when Detective Miller was interviewed by the Tacoma News Tribune, the article caught the attention of J.D. Miller, no relation, I presume, who happened to have been the caseworker that had filed the original referral. Back in 82, J.D. had been contacted by a hospital staff because they were treating a little boy for a suspicious head injury. That boy was Wallace. J.D. then went to the Goudras home where he spoke with Stanley and saw Wallace, who had an impact injury with markings that he felt were consistent with that of an iron. When asked about the mark, Stanley explained that his little Wallace had grabbed the cord of the iron as it sat atop the ironing board, 
causing it to land on his head. There was no further investigation or charges brought because accidents happen, right? As the cold case investigation continued, Detective Jean found Stanley's best friend, Henry, and his ex-wife, Valerie. They confirmed Chom's absence, stating that she would be gone for months at a time, only leaving Stanley feeling more frustrated and burdened. Henry even claimed that Stanley would frequently not just mention that he didn't want the child around, but was actively trying to rid himself of his son. Valerie confirmed those feelings, sharing that Stanley always seemed to be bothered by and felt stuck with Wallace. You know, that's interesting because when you were telling the beginning of the case, Mm -hmm. the first thing that came in my mind was like, Did they check his finances to see if maybe he, like, sold his child to someone? I just had a weird vibe from the beginning. Oh, interesting. What part of that maybe brought that up for you? Um, I think a little bit that he lost his job. So he's in a peak stress. Mm -hmm. Um, How he gave the different information like that to me was a red flag right right away. Then add in possible drinking and other people and a witness actually seeing these other people just made me think that maybe it's human trafficking related. For example, Valerie claimed that when she and Henry were still together, there would be times Stanley would ask them to babysit Wallace for just a few hours, but he wouldn't return for days. When they would get fed up, perhaps not so much with the baby, but with the sudden parenthood, they would actually put Wallace in their car and drive around town until they found Stanley. On those occasions when they were successful, it was clear Stanley was pissed about it. When it came time for the exchange, Wallace would grab onto Henry, crying and holding tight. Detective Jean was also concerned to hear that Henry and Valerie had seen Wallace with black eyes, scratches, bruises, markings, and even casts, one possibly being a body cast, injuries that were always attributed to Wallace's clumsiness. Even though they were friends who spent time together, the only physical violence Henry ever witnessed was when Stanley would be frustrated and pull Wallace towards him via a, quote, vicious shaking. Henry had even more to say. On one occasion, they had taken Stanley and Wallace to Valerie's dad's home. Suddenly, they heard Wallace screaming for his life, so Henry ran around the house where he found Stanley holding a soaking wet Wallace. They were standing near a decorative pond, Wallace had a face of terror and was attempting to get away from Stanley. Once again, Wallace's clumsy nature was to blame for his fall into the pond. But when Wallace ran for his life into Henry's arms, Henry felt he may have witnessed the attempted murder of Wallace. That is scary. Yeah. But he didn't call the police? I think that would be really hard to convince yourself. I guess it's easy to try to explain away a situation, especially just close and a baby. You, it's really hard, I think, to convince yourself that I don't know. I don't trust anybody. I don't either. I'm just saying in general. (laughs) I mean, I would call right away, and I expect horrible things from everyone. But I think that would be really hard to be like, did my friend just try to kill his own son? Yeah. Do I call that in? Because then it ruins the friendship. You know, either way. Yeah. But he. It's not like anyone else witnessed it too. He'd know. Yeah, but also, you know could have saved Wallace, maybe, potentially. Henry's account of Wallace's disappearance was that he learned about it from the news, not his friend. And when he spoke with Stanley about what happened, he claimed the story was that Stanley was fishing in the park, Wallace was on the swings next to the little girl and the mother. Going back to fishing, he eventually looked back to his son and found that he was gone. In this version, he only searched for 40 minutes before calling the police. Valerie added that shortly after Wallace's disappearance, it was her understanding that Stanley attempted to take his own life. Like he told her that? I believe so, yeah. Hmm. Or as she found out through the grapevine, maybe. And was that true and out of guilt, or was that a lie to make them believe that he had nothing to do with it? Right. Is where my brain goes. Or is he, you know, so grief-stricken from the loss? Who knows? Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Another option. All of this new information made Detective Miller even more antsy to speak with Stanley again, so he was off to Louisiana to do so. It was easy to find Stanley. He was still behind bars for killing his wife. At the start of their interview, Stanley's story was very different. In this version, Stanley claimed that he and a friend, Lee, and Lee's children had all been at the park that day. While the men fished, the kids played in a field. It was time for Lee to go, so he took his children and left. Stanley followed suit, 
and that was when he couldn't find Wallace. And in this version, he only searched for 20 minutes before calling 911. Detective Gene was not buying it, so he pushed. He laid out photos of Wallace and pointed out that his story was always changing. Stanley couldn't deny the issues with his story, so he gave one more. For nearly 30 years, he refused to reveal that he felt that his wife had been involved in the taking of Wallace. Blame the dead woman. Yeah, and that she may have had help from that same friend, Lee. Now, I can only imagine Detective Jean giving an eye roll or an eyebrow lift of, what Mm -hmm. the hell are you talking about when he tried that one? But, you know... A for effort, I guess. No. (laughs) Just makes you look worse. Every time. It's like worse and worse and worse. Kudos to Gene Miller for not giving up because he continued to put pressure on Stanley and that's when it all came out. Stanley had taken Wallace fishing at the park. Returning home, it was time to feed him, so he put him in his high chair. Stanley said Wallace was, quote, fussing and all of that and I lost it. And that was when he backhanded Wallace across the head, which knocked him out of his high chair, causing him to hit his head on the floor. And according to Stanley, he had looked for a pulse, but the fall killed him. Oh, my God. Which that does seem believable. This is someone that the child has been seen with markings that are consistent with abuse. That's horrific. I mean, that I mean, that blow would have been very hard. Yes. Yeah. A backhand from a grown man who was in the military against a two-year-old baby, yeah. In a panic, he went to the Tacoma waterfront, which is a two-mile stretch of land at Commencement Bay, carrying Wallace's tiny, lifeless body wrapped in a small flowered blanket, Stanley claimed to have buried him in a hole that was about four feet deep, right along the waterfront of the park. When asked why he didn't tell the truth sooner, Stanley claimed he hadn't wanted to be sent to prison, especially as a child killer. Of course, search crews were sent out to search the waterfront, well, at least a specific section of it, but found nothing. I don't know if they ever used dogs or technology to search the entire waterfront, but I would hope that they did. With a confession in hand, Washington State charged Stanley with first-degree murder in 2014. There was no trial for the murder of Pepitra. He pled guilty to second-degree murder and was given a life sentence. Now he would await extradition to Washington to face the charges for Wallace's death. At the first hearing in Wallace's case, Stanley pled not guilty to manslaughter in the first degree. Stanley's lawyer put up a fight, though, so it's time we learn some legal lingo. In this case, it's corpus delecti. Oh, boy. With my very limited legal capacity, I will try to explain. Basically, it's a principle in place to keep defendants from being convicted of a crime when there isn't sufficient evidence of the crime actually taking place. Boo. In the prosecution's case, they only had Stanley's confession as evidence. No witnesses, no forensics, not even Wallace's body. They could not prove he was deceased. Because of that, the court ruled in favor of the defense suppressing the confession. Without the confession... There was, quite literally, no case, so all charges were dropped. That's bullshit. As much as we talk about false confessions, there are still legit ones, and it's really hard to imagine that Stanley was fraudulent here. He had been running from his son's death for 30 years and was already serving a life sentence in prison, so what point would there be in his lying? So, Wallace's case remains technically open and unsolved. Tips are still wanted, and it's listed on the Charlie Project, which is how I came across it. Eventually, the medical examiner did issue a death certificate for Wallace, listing the cause of death as what his father had claimed, blunt force injury to the head via homicidal violence. For most, the original allegation remains the most likely, that Stanley is responsible, at the very least, for Wallace's disappearance, and most likely his death. So, hopefully it brings some comfort knowing that he will be spending his life in a Louisiana prison. Well, hopefully somebody will find his body. I find it hard to imagine that a four foot, that's not very deep. Unless he lied about where where he did it. Yeah. I really do believe him because it's like, it's been all this time. You know, you're not getting out. You killed your wife. Like, yeah. Why lie about it? It's not like he was bargaining, right? Right. No, there was nothing to it. It was just, they were interviewing him. 
Oh, that's just so unfortunate. Like, I get why the law exists. Right. It just doesn't make sense for me in this case. Not in this case. Yeah. It's a real shame. It's like you have people, I'm sure, that come off the street and go into police stations and say, I killed John F. Kennedy. Like, mm-hmm. you can't. You yeah, can't but go this off is that. like you have a missing child. You have people that witnessed abuse. To me, that's enough. Yeah. To buy some validity in it. I, in a way, it really is like he got away with the perfect murder in like the strangest way. There's still an open case. And if anyone has information about it, um, you're asked to call it in because maybe someone saw something at the park. Maybe someone knew him. And where was that location that he claimed he he buried him? Uh, that was at the Tacoma waterfront. They lived in Fife had gone to Point Defiance at the park, went back home to Fife, and then he drove to the waterfront to bury him. It's just very hard to imagine. I'm picturing Portland waterfront, and from the pictures, I believe it's pretty similar. And it's just hard to imagine a patch of the ground being dug up and, like, animals not getting to it or people not getting to it. It's a big area. There are a lot of places, so I... I don't know. But yeah, if it wasn't if it was shallow, animals may have gotten there. Yeah. So for Wallace's sake and to close his case, I do hope that if his remains are there, that they are located and they can charge the father and and really close that case for everyone that cared about that little boy. Wallace's case is just another example of why talking about these unsolved cold cases matter. Sure, it isn't technically solved, and the answers came from the alleged perpetrator, but perhaps the detective wouldn't have looked at this case again if there hadn't been articles every few years, reminding the community of its lost children. One detective said, quote, Justice matters, no matter how long it takes. No matter how long it takes. A sentiment shared by the families of missing girl Lenoria Jones, who hasn't been seen since the 90s. Her story is coming up right after this short break. For most of us, learning a second language in high school or college wasn't exactly a high point of our academic careers, and there's a good chance there's not a whole lot you remember. Well, I remember sitting behind a very cute boy that I was always flirting with. So I'm guessing you don't remember a whole lot? Un poquito. Now thanks to Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, there's an addictively fun and easy way to learn a new language. Whether you'll be traveling abroad, connecting in a deeper way with friends and family, or you just have some free time to learn something new, Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons that you'll actually use in the real world. I started using Babbel two weeks ago to learn Spanish. I ended up choosing it because Spanish is spoken in 21 countries and your girl likes to travel. Babbel is a great way to learn Spanish or to try any of their 14 offered languages, including French, Italian, German, and more. Their 15-minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. Babbel lessons were created by over 100 language experts, and their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, save up to 60% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash rain. That's babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash rain for up to 60% off of your subscription. Babbel, language Language for for life. Josh, usually when I need to buy something for my masculine friends and family, I have the hardest time figuring out what to buy. But not anymore. I got lucky and found Trend Him. I know Trend Him. Trend Him offers high quality and affordable accessories for men. They have everything you can think of, from tie accessories and hats to travel bags and watches. They have more than 6,500 different products. Exactly. Now I'm not going to be aimlessly wandering around Target when I need to find the perfect gift. I can go online and find it at Trend Him. In fact, that's what I did this past weekend, and I have a surprise for you. Trend Him offers some very high quality watches, and they're all customizable. You can have them engraved or even upload a custom picture. So of course, I had to get us some one-of-a-kind Murder in the Rain watches that we can wear and maybe even give one away to one of our lucky listeners. They should arrive any day now. 
I hope you nabbed some of their awesome sunglasses, too. You know it. I can't wait to see how those watches turn out. And if you want to customize a watch, too, Murder in the Rain listeners can get 15% off their Trend Him order. You can click the link on the Murder in the Rain promo codes page or go directly to trnd.hm slash rain and use our discount code rain to get 15% off your order. It's hard to imagine and even harder to live through being a mother who signs away her parental rights. But that's exactly what Lenoria Elise Ann Jones's young mother, Deidre Jones, chose to do after giving birth to her three days into the new year, 1992. While that choice must have been difficult, maybe she knew she was doing what was best for her daughter as she was struggling with a drug addiction, one that she passed on to Lenoria. As a baby, she was able to detox, but the damage the cocaine she absorbed in the womb had left her with a dysfunction surrounding regulating arousal and attention. So instead of a chemical or perhaps what you could dub naturally occurring ADHD, the cocaine damaged her regulation abilities, causing ADHD. Drug use had been an issue for Deidre, even getting arrested while she was pregnant for selling. Her later conviction and jail time probably helped her in making the decision of whether to keep Lenoria or not. She must have felt her daughter would have been left in good hands because multiple family members vied for custody during the dependency court rulings. From birth, Lenoria was shuffled around to different family members throughout Washington, her mother leaving the Pacific Northwest and rehab, and her probation, all to go to Arkansas. Eventually, Lenoria ended up in the care of her great-aunt on her mother's side, as her father's identity was unknown, Berlin Williams. This seemed like a great fit. Berlin ran a daycare and was happy to not only take legal custody of the almost three-year-old, but she was in the process of adopting her. Legal parental rights were officially signed over in 1995. Finally, she would have a steady living situation. To help with the Noria's ADHD, she was prescribed Norpramin, a non-stimulant drug. It, of course, came with the side effects we've all come to know so well about with every medication. Headaches, nausea, dizziness, insomnia, weight gain, dry mouth, etc. But it was safe for children to take. On July 20th, 1995, the three-year-old little girl and her great-aunt slash caregiver were headed into the Target on South Union Avenue. Soon, police received a call from Berlin reporting that her, for all intents and purposes, child was missing. She had disappeared while they were shopping and was nowhere to be found. Police arrived a little before 10 a.m. and questioned Berlin. She claimed that they had walked into the store and she started to look at bathing suits. After coming out of her shopping-induced distraction, she realized Lenoria was gone. Employees continued their search as she spoke with the officers. At first, the implication was that Lenoria had only been missing for moments, but after further conversation, it was revealed that it was closer to about 15 minutes. Just like with Wallace's case, word spread and soon the community was out searching the area surrounding the target. Time was passing quickly, and it was clear something more was going on. Either someone had taken Lenoria and they were long gone, or she had never been at the store to begin with. Assuming it was the former that had occurred, officers requested the security camera footage from that morning. Watching through it, they soon found the images of Berlin entering the store. Alone. Informing her of the video footage, Berlin had a perfectly good reason— Well, now that she was thinking about it, the last time she had actually spoken to Lenoria was when they were getting out of the car. Therefore, she felt that whomever had taken her had done it in broad daylight, in the parking lot, and in just the amount of time it took to go from the car to the building. And they were quiet enough that no one, not even Berlin, noticed. Do they have cameras on the outside of Target? I don't know that they did. It wasn't mentioned, so maybe not. And if it hadn't been that, then Lenoria just wandered off. But that was just as unlikely as they were searching and found no sign of her having been in the area. Finally, Berlin said, well, maybe she wasn't with me. Mm -hmm. Now that every alarm had been set off for law enforcement, the focus wasn't just on finding Lenoria, but finding out what else Berlin knew. As the investigation went on, they soon discovered that a phone call was placed at 8.47 a.m., the morning of Lenoria's reported disappearance. With her own children sharing her home with her, it appeared Berlin stopped at a convenience store and called her own home. 
It was then reported that one of her adult daughters spoke with her, and that's when Berlin informed her that she couldn't find Lenoria. After that stop, she then went to the Target and nearly an hour later called the police. The day after her disappearance, Berlin was brought in for official questioning. Because of her continuing story changes and the suspicious circumstances surrounding Lenoria's disappearance, the Department of Social and Health Services suspended the license of her daycare, called God's Wonderful World of Colors. Oh, boy. So you know it's good. That's a red flag in general. (laughs) For real. Throughout the multiple interviews, her story changed again and again. Variations included Lenoria walking away from their house and getting lost, two black men kidnapping her from the neighborhood, and she even claimed that she was safe but being held in an undisclosed location. On the 23rd, one of Berlin's daughters held a press conference at their home. The story they were sticking to was that something happened between the car and the doors of the Target. Well, for the most part. She also claimed Lenoria had asked, can I have a toy, as they were walking in, to which Berlin answered, once we finish looking for me a bathing suit, we can go look for a toy. Two days later, Berlin gave her only public comment, where she blamed the media and the police. She denied having anything to do with Lenoria's disappearance and pointing out that she had lost everything, her loved one and career. So what benefit was there to her hiding anything? Just six days into the disappearance, the first of several dependency hearings were held for the family surrounding Lenoria. Since she was still in the custody of child services, they hoped that questioning the family under oath would lead to the answers they needed. Nothing significant came from the hearings except investigators realized that the family members' stories all remain the same with each questioning. Only Berlin was changing her story. On the 30th of July, a new theory. Perhaps Lenoria's disappearance and possible death was related to her medication. While Norpramin is considered safe for children, it is more of an adult medication and is more often used as an antidepressant. It quickly started to seem that perhaps Berlin, who had never had a complaint at her daycare or from her children regarding abusive behavior, had accidentally given her soon-to-be daughter too much and she overdosed and died. However, there was no proof of that happening, of anyone knowing anything about it, or Berlin hiding her body. Did they ask for the medication bottle? I, I don't know for sure. I didn't see that specifically, but I would assume Because so. I would have counted, you know, from the day that right. it was prescribed. And- yeah. I I would assume, I would really hope, fingers crossed, that they did actually take that as part of the investigation. Into August, and Lenoria had already been gone a month. Police spoke with her biological mother and grandparents and ruled out there being any kind of custody issue that would lead to Lenoria being kidnapped. A few days after that, the police publicly released the security footage from Target. It was hard not to notice that Berlin didn't look back like a parent does when going inside a building. She didn't hold the door as if she was there with another person. It seemed pretty clear that she knew she was there alone. On September 11th, a report came out showing that a caseworker with child services was hesitant to give Berlin custody of Lenoria back in 1994. Mm -hmm. The report said, quote, Since in the past, Williams has not seemed to make good judgments about normal children, these poor judgments would be more detrimental to a special needs child. But let's go ahead and let her have a daycare. Absolutely. The outcome of the dependency hearings led to conversations about possible contempt charges. Instead, Berlin was put on house arrest on the 21st of September. Right before Christmas, filings were made in an effort to give Lenoria's biological grandparents full custody so that if she were to be found, she would be able to go home with them. Officials felt they were on the right track with Berlin, so they wanted to put more pressure on her. They asked her priest to inquire about the medication in hopes that she would feel more comfortable speaking with him, and he had permission to assure her she would face less harsh of a sentence if she came clean. That's an interesting tactic. Isn't it, though? I don't know how I feel about that. That's that's a moral quandary, I believe (laughs) they call that. Yikes. To commemorate what would have been Lenoria's fourth birthday, the 911 call from the Target that morning was released. Berlin's non-emotional tone had many people feeling even more skeptical about her story. After a legal fight, she was released from house arrest on January 19th. By the spring, there was no evidence of any wrongdoing, so there were still no charges. 
even though the investigation showed that the last time anyone outside of Berlin had seen Lenoria was the Sunday before she died as they were leaving church on the 16th, four days before the 911 call. The lawyer involved in the lawsuit for the grandparents' custody battle said, quote, We don't know that Lenoria isn't around, but Berlin Williams just can't exactly remember where she put her. Things only got worse for Berlin when, on March 19th, she reported that as she walked behind the local Fred Meyer, which is kind of similar to a Target but leaning towards more of a focus on groceries, a man stalked her before he attacked her, grabbing her neck and holding a knife to her. The police followed up on her report but were unable to not only catch the perpetrator, they weren't even sure the attack had even taken place. Was this lady like Munchausen's by proxy with but the cops? Really horrible stuff. Yeah, I don't like, know. What is going on? As the custody dispute went on, Frank and Annie Jones, the grandparents, shared concerning incidents, like how when they arrived at Berlin's home the day after the disappearance, there wasn't much talk of Lenoria. There was more concern about how Berlin was doing, and Berlin wasn't concerned with apologizing to the family. At fault or not, they had hoped to receive a little bit of sympathy. It was also noted that when they visited with Lenoria at Berlin's a month before she went missing, they could tell something was wrong. The bubbly, excitable little girl that liked to water the plants with her grandpa and watch Barney with her grandma was already missing in a way. She was quiet, reserved. It was concerning. Just as concerning as when Deidre, Lenoria's mother, claimed that she called Berlin's home on the 18th, two days before the reported disappearance, and asked to talk to her daughter. Berlin would not allow it. Oh, boy. When Berlin's legal team tried to explain the changes in her story by saying that she had mental issues, the family, especially her brother, Grandpa Frank, did not buy it. Just like he didn't buy her losing track of the baby while going into the store. Not only had she run a daycare for 12 years without incident, she was always the one in the family to care for the babies and children. She was observant and patient. Frank could tell from the way she was walking into the store that she was not looking out for a child or reaching out for her hand as she always did. When he sat down with his sister and asked direct questions and she refused to answer, it severed their relationship. Around the one-year anniversary of Lenoria's disappearance, the body of Cindy Angler of Emily's episode was discovered just two weeks after she went missing, renewing hope that Lenoria's family would at least get closure to that extent. The questioning of the family members in and out of the house was completed, and after clearing any custody or kidnapping concerns, no one has been questioned since 1995. And that is the case surrounding Lenoria Jones. That is appalling. There have been no leads. Berlin is the only suspect, but there isn't enough evidence to prosecute. Every few years, there are articles reminding the Tacoma area that it's been X number of years, As I write this, it's right at the 27th anniversary since her disappearance. The Charlie Project and our blog have an age-progressed photo, but even her own family has long lost hope that she's alive. Not that they've given up hope to find her, but with Berlin's ever-changing stories, they know that something much worse than losing track of her inside of a Target took place. If you were in the Tacoma area on July 20th, 1995, and saw a young girl matching Lenoria's description, of a black three-year-old about three feet tall, 40 pounds, with braided hair, wearing turquoise pants and a black shirt adorned with a picture of Barney the dinosaur, and her nickname was Noria. So if you know anything about Berlin's connection to the case, or maybe you know where she is, or you saw something happen that day, please call the Tacoma Police Department at 253-798-4721. I get vibes like the Oakley Carlson case where it's like, we know who's involved. That's the one that's happening in Washington right now, right? Right now, yeah, basically. And it was a custody thing. She was put in in foster care and then the parents were given back parental rights. They went to get her and nobody has ever seen her again. Right. Um, So it's it's really hard because there are, (laughs) there's only so much you can do without evidence, Mm -hmm. without a body, without something. And it's really frustrating. Yeah, it goes back to Wallace's case where you have a dad admitting to killing his son, but you can't even prove that that child is dead. You can't prove where they are or that anything happened. And as much as I feel like in that case, they could probably say, yeah, he did it. He's gone. It's still like unsolved until you find their body and lay them to rest. And Lenoria's is so strange because it's just 
why would the story keep changing? It makes me wonder, um, you know, she had grown kids in the house. Did something transpire between those kids? Did something transpire with one of the kids in the daycare and she panicked? I do think the medication's an interesting angle because when you have a, a kid with special needs like that that requires a regular attention medication right. schedule, you get stressed out, you give her too much, give her too little, accidents happen, and then you... Yeah, I mean, that is a likely scenario. But yeah, there's so many other scenarios, too. I'm curious, too, with that medication. So if anyone listening happens to, like, be an expert in that medication, I, I kind of read up on it, and it it seems like it's fairly difficult to overdose. But again, she was just a three-year-old. She was mm. tiny. So, yeah, I'm not sure what that would look like. Or did she get into it? Was this woman so scared of losing her licensure and therefore her business because a child died in the house that she covered it up that that to me would not the most sense but maybe um i mean people do strange things when they're when they don't know what to do mm -hmm. right i mean we see it all the time in cases yeah but i mean who knows like i know i keep going to human trafficking but it's like you got a missing kid where do they go yeah unless you find a body like there's so many scenarios i don't i don't know that with this one that that would make sense just because she did have the daycare she had her own kids she had yeah seems you know, like an accident or something's yeah. more likely yeah so and it was weird too that they tried to push um oh she has mental health issues the, now, when you say that, the child or the parent? The parent, the Berlin, the, the, the aunt. Parent, right? And so it was like, but why are there no other issues? Your business has never had an issue. Your children never had an issue. Why now with this child? Would there, would it suddenly be Stress. that you can't mentally handle it? Stress. That's true. And and if she's, you know, I I have worked with I dozens and dozens of drug affected children and it can be a range of behaviors and some of those behaviors do test your patients a lot more than others so it's yeah it's totally possible that someone even though she had a bunch of her own children that were adults and had all those kids in the daycare it can be just that one kid that yeah pushes your limit in one way or another we do so. see a lot of cases where an accident happens and they just go and leave the child somewhere and and in those cases are often found with like dressed and wrapped in blankets yeah, and things yeah. so it'd be interesting if they do recover remains what yeah. we could learn from you that. would just think by now especially if it was an accident that's the thing that always really confuses me it's like if it's an accident all you have to do is communicate like i'm sorry about your daycare but you need to tell his family where this baby is you know to say like here's what happened she fell we did her medication wrong. So, so that's where I get a little yeah. twinge of like, maybe there's something else happening because yeah, you could have answered this question 30 something years ago. Well, maybe break from stress, abused her, went too far. And, you know, yeah, there's so many snares that could have happened. It's really sad. And, and, and who knows? Maybe she did have some sort of mental break pulling into the target and was walking inside and someone took Lenoria from her. It could Highly have unlikely, happened, but I don't think definitely, so. you know, you never can't you know, rule it out. So there's there's no uh, no answers, you know, and that's this is all alleged and everything, of course. So uh, just waiting for anyone that knows something. And that's why I want to cover these cases that are older, because you do hear so often uh, the, the next one I'll be covering. Uh, a kid was like, you know, I told them information. They never called me back. And so he checked in like 20 years later and they're like, what? You know, so it's like yeah, it slips through sharing the that information and, and you never know what you see, have seen or heard that might actually close a case. I right away got a weird mm -hmm. um, leprechaun vibe from him and yeah. I'm just not into it. It seems unimaginable. Oh, boy. The couple was transferred to Fork, Fork, Forks, Washington, where they <laughs> met Edward. Oh my God, Twilight! Uh, oh yeah. Uh, oh, I was holding mine too. <laughs> Josh, <laughs> <laughs> he just farts. That sounded nice. Nice. <laughs> Did that sound nice? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Wallace's parents' parents. Remember last night I was trying to get bit and I yelled Pharrell. 
what? <laughs> we were talking about Pharrell and I was pretty stoned and Bit started barking. So I went, Pharrell. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely called Chloe by like the dog's name and vice versa, but I've never yelled out. I a- just, we literally were talking and we were talking about the whole Khalees Pharrell Beyonce oh, yeah. thing. And I was like, yeah, well, Pharrell had the thing. And then Pharrell. And then I cried at my brain sadness. That's awesome. Ah. What are you having, a Danish? Nope. Oh, I want Donut? A, I want a hot dog. <laughs> Some string cheese is rolled oh, up in a little piece of naan. Oh, love string love cheese. string cheese. Wait, you eat it like a solid piece of cheese? Yeah, yes, he right does. Now. No, he always does. I think it tastes better as string. This string cheese is maybe the softest, <laughs> cheesiest string cheese of all creamy. time. It's a very what creamy. Kind? It's a very creamy Some string Some weird cheese. brand I've never heard of. It's Italian, though. You know what you should try? Do you have an air fryer? Yeah. What I like to do is make cheese sticks out of them. You nasty. Mm-hmm. Oh. Then I have a little marinara. Oh my gosh. So good. Just give it a shot then. Who cares? Tilda Jean, that's it. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production. Written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough. Edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls.